Hello, my name is Alicia Middleman. I am a curator at the Estes Park Museum. Today is March 7th, 2013, and I'm in the home of Harry Kent. We're gonna interview him as part of a oral history project with the Estes Valley Library and the Estes Park Museum. Today is March 17th, 2013. What is your full name? Harry Ernest Kent. And when and where were you born? Boston, Massachusetts, 1955. When, Harry, did you become interested in rock climbing? My brother, Jeff, got me interested in it, and I was in sixth grade, I think. And he came home one day and says, we gotta try rock climbing. So um, we were, I was born, uh, or living in situate Massachusetts, uh, on the water, and he bought a hemp rope and he said, we're going to the Quincy quarries to go climbing. And that was just a quarry where they mined rock. So we showed up there. There were a few other climbers. And so that was, I th so I was in sixth grade. Yeah. And we went to. How do you think he had some exposure to rock climbing? I think he met somebody at his college, maybe, uh, or had heard about it. And then he probably went into Eastern Mountain Sports in Boston and realized oh, well, there's a little climbing scene at this place called Quincy Quarries. And he said, we got to go there. Yeah. yeah. What was that climbing scene like? Um, I'm, the quarry is no longer there. It's, there's homes, condos, and all that. It was a hole in the ground with sort of cliffs on each side, maybe 40 or 50 feet high. Um, and some of the rock was decomposed. Some was very nice granite with tiny little cracks. Um, the anchors were uh, big trees on top and uh, we had no idea how to make knots or to anchor into anything. Um, so a lot of inexperienced people were, were there. Um, and yet uh, it was sort of, I think people found out about it from Eastern Mountain Sports and the locals. So it grew some, but um, it was pretty tiny. Yeah, tiny spot. Um. How then did you have access to equipment? Was it at EMS and, or was there right. some sharing um, gear? We, you know, we bought the rope at the hardware store and I remember, and then we had heard about the Shawangunks. We heard that, hey, that's really where the climbing is. So, um, oh, and we also um, knew that uh, there was gear called chocks and eccentrics, but we had really never seen any because at the Quincy Quarries, it was all rope and webbing that we used. So um, we didn't buy any gear, but we loaded up my brother's Volkswagen one day and drove to New York to the Schwangunks, got in the parking lot, and we probably had some, I don't know if there was a guidebook or if just somebody said, hey, just go and park here and start climbing. Go to the parking area, and we started hiking into some climb we were gonna do, and I'll never forget there was a climber coming down the trail and I could hear the sound of his rack, of the hexcentrics and the chocks making that sound that is unique only to aluminum wedges. And I'll never forget that. And I went, we're climbing. This is the, this is the big leagues. And so we were kind of nervous. And I don't remember that day climbing. I don't know what we did, where we went, um, but uh, I think Jeff had a friend that had some gear, and it's likely we met him there, and he took us or something. Mm -hmm. So, um, when were you introduced to the Rocky Mountains? Well, um, again, my brother Jeff was a huge influence in my life. He hitchhiked uh, when he was in high school. Sometime he hitchhiked uh, to Colorado and then continued on, and he discovered climbing here in, in Rocky Mountain National Park. He didn't do much climbing, but he went, oh, this is also the big deal. So he came back, and at this time I was in high school, and I was ready to do a road trip uh, for a few weeks one summer. I think I was a junior in high school. So I stuck out my thumb and ended up in Rocky Mountain National Park, and I looked up and I went, holy mackerel, this is really cool. On that trip, that's where I first met my best friend and still lifelong climbing partner, Keith Lober. He was working at Outdoor World. And I walk in there with my pack and a pair of Royal Robins climbing shoes, 
hung over my shoulder because I wanted to look like a climber. And he's a clerk behind the, the counter. And I said, hey, uh, what's the climbing scene here? I want to do some climbing. And he's like, oh, let's go after work. You know, I can go ahead and uh, I know some places to go. So we made a deal, you know. So I came back after he got off work. And he was even less experienced than I was at the time. And so we went to the rocks above. Uh, it used to be Rock Acres. So it, what's that called now? Uh, there's a restaurant. Black Canyon. Black Canyon. So we went there and bolted around, put some ropes up. And then I think the next day we went to the Thumb and Needle. Uh, had a scary experience there. I was halfway up leading. And I looked down and all my gear had come out, you know, pretty beginner. And it was all sitting right there in his belay plate. <clears throat> um, and so I'm holding on and I said, what do I do? He goes, just untie. I'll go ahead and climb around to the top of the thumb and I'll lower you down a figure eight knot and then you can clip in and I'll belay you to the top. And that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. And this was when you were a teenager. You're still in high school in at high this school. point? I was a junior. Did you have to go back to Massachusetts? I did, yeah. And when you were there, mm -hmm. were you participating in some of the more traditional sports at your high school too? I was. Um, I was uh, into soccer and I was also a wrestler. So, um, but there really wasn't much climbing, you know, where I grew up. The, the quarries, by then, I don't know, I think I had lost interest or maybe just, uh, I mean, when I went back, I knew I really loved climbing, but the quarries wasn't the place to go. We could have gone to Mount Washington and all that, but I went back and had to stay in school and finish my high school. As soon as I graduated from high school, I worked a little bit on my summer job, and then I hitchhiked back out here. And Keith was still here, um, and so we did some more climbing then. That was our first attempt on Long's Peak. Um, that was pretty funny. And then uh, I had to go to college, but I didn't start college until January of 74. So I, we climbed a lot in the fall around here, and then I went to college, and he followed me to college, Keith did. Okay, this is a cool story. Where was so, that? Um, Southern California, United States International University. So I'm in school, right? Well, actually, the day of enrollment, when college students arrive, to enroll, here comes Keith. Hitchhiked in. So they started to think that he was a student. He had full access to the cafeteria without a card. He, had, he was living for free. So I would go to class and he'd go climbing during the day, hitchhike to Mission Gorge, which probably is still there, I think. It's a small, again, little tiny climbing area. So he started climbing, hitchhiking around, and then he'd come back for dinner and he stayed in my dorm, and then I'd do my classes. That lasted two and a half months. By then, we both knew we had to go back to Colorado. We just had to climb. I was spending my, mo my mother and father's money, and I did good, but I didn't have the passion for school. It was all about climbing. So we hitchhiked back here, lived in a teepee for a while, on somebody's property, had no money. Whereabouts was that? That was off of Mary's Lake Road, Upper Riverside, or Upper Broadview, up Mary's Lake Road. Yeah, and um, all we did was climb. And we got jobs, I had, I think my first job was at the Mountaineer Restaurant when that was downtown. Um, and uh, all we did was wash dishes and get time off to climb. Then I graduated to the Holiday Inn as a dishwasher, same drill, just kept climbing, kept washing dishes. Then I became a breakfast cook, a little more responsibility. And we would go off every spring to Yosemite Valley for two or three, uh, two months. Uh, and then I'd come back and got my job back and then do some more cooking and keep climbing. Did Keith continue to work at Outdoor World? No, by that time, I'm sure he had been fired. And so um, he started on a path into medicine, actually. Um, he was a, well, later on, um, we had taken an EMT class together. I'm, I'm going to say that was probably in 1980, early 80s. And he realized, oh, this is probably going to be a good field for him. So he started... Um, taking more classes and doing more training in paramedicine, 
and eventually became a paramedic, traveled all over the country to pretty intense cities to gain his training, and then eventually he got a job with the National Park, worked here as a Long Peak Ranger for a season, and then started moving around into the national parks. Yeah. So. And to be clear, that year that you left college and moved to Estes Park, what year was that? 74. 1974. Spring of 74. Okay. And you mentioned that you had a funny story about climbing Long's Peak together. Yeah. Our first time, it was, um, so that would have been in the fall of 70, uh, hang on. No, that would have been in the spring of 74. Um, so, you know, could have been bad weather. Uh, it was a pretty mild spring, I, I think, that year. We had no clue about gear, food, what to take and all that. So we just stuffed some stuff in some packs, sleeping bags, and started hiking up to the boulder field. Made it to the boulder field and then made it up to the Agnes Vale shelter cabin. And we bivouacked in that, you know, why, why not, you know? So, and then a storm came in, and the next day, I should look for these photos, um, we staged a photo of Keith at the base of the North Face, just outside of the uh, shelter cabin, taking one step up with an ice axe on his pack and everything to make it look like we were climbing up. But the, we had no in tension of climbing up the North Face. You know, we had a rope and probably had two ice axes and that's all. Because um, we were going to do the keyhole. Okay. But we wanted people to think that we were climbing. Um, so it was a miserable night we spent. We were freezing and uh, our water froze and, you know, our boots froze and we, we just, it was uh, exciting. Yeah. And then did you hike up? the keyhole or did you do a technical traverse across the ridge or cables route? Nope, we took that photo and packed up and headed back home. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But you've made your, your way back to Long's Peak many times since. Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, in addition to climbing with Keith, who were some of your other climbing partners in those earlier years? There were several. Um, in the early years, there was Joe Laddick. He's now living and working in Alaska. Uh, Dennis Laird was uh, a local. Um, uh, Scott Kimball, of course. Um, you know, several others. And I guess my uh, slips my, my memory right now. Um, uh, Doug Snively, of course, uh, and Billy Westbay was around then. It was a little early, later on in then. So, uh, yeah, there was this kind of uh, very close-knit community of climbers. And uh, all we wanted to do was climb. Uh, we valued climbing over anything else. We valued it over uh, money. We valued climbing over uh, responsibility. Um, it, it took took most of us uh, and we gave it a lot, you know. It was a passion, still is. Tell me more about that. Why did it rule your life, climbing? Well, it was exciting. It was a lifestyle that uh, we weren't, uh, it was in some ways easy um, because that's all we had to do was climb. We didn't have to get real jobs. We didn't have to, there was no other responsibilities that we had. All, we just loved climbing so much that that's all we wanted to do. And we did, we, we sort of blew off the rest. I should speak for myself. I mean, I just sort of blew off the rest of responsibility and just pursued climbing. I mean, sure, I had a job along the way and I stayed in contact with my parents and all that, but climbing took over. It's a passion. I, it's just so fun to feel being outside and moving your body and touching real nature, touching stone and, and the feeling the process of the movement on it. Um, and also the difficulty, you know, I think a, 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 a tonic struggle is really good, you know, to really go, whoa, this is hard, you know. So um, 
I just love the, the process of it. You know, I liked the, the difficulty, I liked the challenge, um, and uh, it was thrilling too. You know, it was thrilling. Yeah. Tell me then, when did you transition from climbing and setting your own pursuits um, in Estes Park and transition to guiding? Yeah. I think I started guiding um, in nine, er, very early 80s. I'm going to say maybe 70. No, I'm going to say it was 1970. Nine, the summer of 1979. Boy, do I have that right? 70, 1977, I believe. And I had an apartment with 20 other people over by the hospital. And uh, uh, we used to call it Floyd's Hotel, this apartment. And I was the one that was responsible for the rent. It was $100 a month. And on any given night, there literally, I mean that, there were, could have been 15 or 20 people on the floor. It had one big living room, a tiny little kitchen, and a bathroom. And I can remember having to go to work in the morning. I had to do the breakfast ship at, at 6, and I'd have to be, I'd step over sleeping bags, and then I'd hear this grunting and groaning, and so anyway, I'd make my way to work. So I was um, in that apartment, and... Uh, I believe it was Dan McClure and Billy West Bay and maybe Jim Bridwell showed up to the apartment and they said, hey, do you want to start guiding a little bit for Covington? He owned the concession at the time and the school was Fantasy Ridge School of Alpinism. And I, I went, me? Be a guide? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, they uh, said, well, there's a class tomorrow and we think you should audit it. We think you should check it out and see if this is something, you know, if you can help. Boy, was I nervous and here I was guiding and I mean, I, I think I was a good climber, but I had no experience guiding. And so I went and that's kind of how I started guiding under their tutelage and took a few courses, uh, audited a couple classes and then eventually they cut me loose and I could start taking clients on uh, basic rock classes. Back then we called it Rock 1, Rock 2, and we could take them on climbs of the Twin Owls too. Was Michael Covington your instructor? Um, no, Michael in the business, and he would take out clients and stuff, but uh, no, uh, Billy Westbay was the first person, yeah, that I followed on some of these classes. I observed him, yeah. And for those courses, once you graduated to the level to take clients out, mm -hmm. who were these folks? Who were the clients? Oh, they were tourists. Um, some of them just wanted to go rappelling. Some of them were very interested in rock climbing and actually wanted uh, a guide to show them how to put their hands in the rock and how to make a fish jam, how to use your feet. Um, so they had some, some had pre-knowledge of climbing. Um, others just wanted to try it and see what it was like. How long did you guide for the Colorado Mountain School or Fantasy Ridge? Fantasy Ridge, right. Um, um, really, I, start, I was guiding for several years. Um, and then when Mike Donahue um, took over the concession, um, you know, he changed the name to Colorado Mountain School. And then I continued to guide and to help out um, Mike Donahue at that time. I was guiding part-time for uh, Fantasy Ridge, for Mike Covington. He had a lot of guides around and um, uh, quite a scene. So, and I was sort of low on the totem pole. You know, I wasn't as experienced. I wasn't as good a climber. Um, back then, to have a climbing school, the focus was on you wanted the well-known, really good climbers. You know, nowadays, um, particularly with my school, um, that's not really what I need for guides. I need people who are good with children and who are safe and who are, can present something uh, in a good way. Anyway, so I was part-time, yeah, for those guys. Mm -hmm. And part-time probably allowed you to continue with some of your own climbing goals and pursuits? Definitely. Um, 
the whole point you got to understand is climb as much as you can and work as little as possible to have enough money to support your climbing. And that's what we did for many years, not just like a season. It, it went on and on and on. I can remember thinking that, you know, I've climbed 300 days this year. I mean, lots, just lots of climbing. And, um, but, and I continued to have my cooking job, continued to guide part-time, and yes, continued to go to Yosemite um, twice a year, in the fall and in the spring. And then eventually, Keith and I discovered the Alps. This coincided with what we had started to do here, which was winter climbing, winter ascents of, in the national park. And we, Keith and I, when we would go bouldering, we'd sometimes go bouldering in winter with our crampons on, and we'd just to train for the Alps. And I can remember going, hey, let's pretend we're on the Hintastarsa Traverse, so let's pretend we're on the Walker Spur. And so, and we would boulder with crampons and ice axes and, and you know, I, I'd like to think we took our training seriously. It's nothing like the athletes are doing nowadays for training, but we made an attempt to train. So we just got it, discovered winter climbing and in order to get in shape for the Alps, we had to start climbing in Rocky Mountain National Park. And this park has some of the most beautiful, difficult, challenging, wonderful winter climbs you could possibly imagine. And if you're able to handle the weather in Rocky Mountain National Park and actually get up some of these faces in winter, um, you don't need any other training to climb around the world for that. What kind of conditions are you facing? Um, uh, winter in the park, wind, huge. Uh, Pretty cold, but you know, sometimes you'll get a, a, a phase when it's pretty warm too. I mean, I think zero degrees, sometimes colder, especially if a front drops some participation, then when the front moves on, uh, it gets colder right after that front passes. And this was always a, a big deal because back then, early on, we didn't have bivy tents, we didn't have fancy, you know, porta ledges we could set up on climbs. The bivouacs were generally open. Um, on some of the faces, unless we were down the day before, we could dig a snow cave or something. And we didn't have the money, frankly, even to buy tents back then. Um, I can remember we didn't have cars. And so a winter ascent was a big deal. We'd hitchhike into the park with our packs. And so you might get to the trailhead in the morning. You might get to the trailhead at four in the afternoon and you just, that's the time frame you were on. And then when you were done with the climb, you'd ski back out to the trailhead and go, well, you're exhausted, you're wet, you're hungry, you're tired, stick out your thumb, somehow get back to town. Now, and I can remember when we first bought our, our car, it's like, oh, this is so good, we can get there and then we can get back. And sometimes the car never started, but it was a big deal, so. I've got to ask, are there any memorable moments hitchhiking in the park with all of your gear? Um, rock climbers were not a common sight, especially in the winter. Yeah. How did people react to seeing you out there? It was unusual to see people hitchhiking in the park with full-on winter gear and packs. Uh, I don't have any memorable stories of that. I, the only memorable story I have is when we finally reached an era where we had a car and we didn't have to go through all that anymore. But going back to the bivouacs, generally they were open. And uh, so if a front came through, you'd get real wet and you'd get real cold. And then when the front passed, if you were still climbing, um, it was cold, you know? So you had to, you know, take all the precautions, sleep with your boots in your sleeping bag and keep moving during the night and stuff. And um, back then too, for the winter ascents, it was a big deal to do winter ascents, which starts December 22nd. That's the winter season technically. And it ends uh, March 21st, I think, is the end of winter. So <clears throat> uh, if you started climbing during the shortest days of the year in December, in January, those were long bivouacs. And those are what we used to call the 16 hour bivouac. 
meaning for 16 hours, you're miserable. You'd, you'd have eight hours to climb, and also back then the headlamps weren't great, so it's not like you, oh, just climb through the night. You could ski in in the night with a headlamp, but when it really came time to climb, and you needed daylight. And so I recall being real miserable on some of these winter scents we did. Yeah. All right. We were just discussing that uh, you and Keith were training hard, um, making a lot of winter scents in Rocky Mountain National Park, yeah. really pushing yourselves hard there. Um, this is in the late 1970s, early 80s. Yes. Mm -hmm. In 1982, uh, you and Keith made the first American winter scent of the north face of the Eiger in Switzerland. The Eiger is a 1,300-foot mountain in the Viennes Alps, and um, there's different areas to climb there. The North Wall had a very tragic history of, of um, climbers trying and, and not making it. There were fatalities. How did you two decide to go after this project? We had read books for many years before we thought we were ready, and, and the Eiger was always on our radar, you know, as was other climbs in the Alps, but the Eiger was always, we might do that someday, and that's why we climbed so hard around here in winter. We climbed several new routes on the east face of Taylor in winter, several new routes uh, on McHenry's, um, uh, Long's Peak, of course, Keener's, and difficult routes on the lower east face. Um, Ypsilon, all for the Alps, all for training for the Eiger. <clears throat> we designed some of our own gear back then, like we had Rich Perch, uh, Rich Page, who had Buzzard Mountaineering design a tent for us. So we started kind of steering towards this. <clears throat> and then it was time. Um, we had made uh, a trip to the Alps earlier, uh, a year or two before. Uh, not to climb the Eiger, just to climb the big walls over there. And we started getting our feet wet and realizing, okay, I think we can do this, and let's keep an eye on the, how we're feeling. And then we just threw down our money and uh, bought the ticket and went over there in probably, it must have been uh, February, February sometime of 82. Checked into the youth hostel and uh, started waiting for weather. And we would ski to keep active to keep in shape. We helped out on a movie that the Brits were making on uh, an ascent of the Eiger. They were documenting John Harlan's tragic climb on the North Wall, and so we met up with some well-known British climbers, helped them uh, do some things with the filming, and then that was done, and um, we made three attempts that were all aborted uh, because of weather and it was getting down to the wire because in order to make the attempts, we had to buy a train ticket up to Kleine Scheidegg. And every time we went, that was money that we spent. And we're like, you know, we only can afford about one more train ride up here unless we want to start hiking up. So finally on the fourth try, um, the weather was reasonable and uh, we got to start up the wall, left our skis at the base and never got those back. And uh, eight days later, we were back down in Kleine Scheidegg. So we were on the wall for six nights. Uh, would, uh, and then uh, actually we were on the wall for six nights and then one night on the way down. So I guess seven days later, yeah. Did you alternate leads? Yeah. Yeah, the north face of the Eiger is 6,000 vertical feet, and it is, the summit is about 13,000 feet. Um, so it's over a mile and a half high, and uh, we climbed the classic 1938 route, um, and it was a journey in history for us. Nowadays, I think the Eiger has been climbed in like three hours. I mean, it's, it's absurd when you compare what we did to what is being done now. It has a lot of history. Every single sort of bivouac on there is named, like the Swallow's Nest, um, the uh, Hinterstrasse Traverse, and um, uh, the White Spider, and, and everything has a name on the Eiger. It's just steeped in history. Taking seven days to climb it 
we were able to sleep at every famous bivouac, you know, the Swallow's Nest, the cave, the wet bivy, all of them. And we could go, wow, we're really here doing this. Even though it was a very stressful climb, it was, you know, very scary for us. And, and there really does come a place on the Eiger, particularly in winter, where there's no retreat. And that's okay. And um, so it was the most beautiful experience in the world as well. And it was very emotional. I'll never forget. We were on the summit for two nights waiting for the avalanche conditions to improve so we could descend down the west flank. We started down the day before when we got on top. And uh, Keith, a big, huge slab kicked off below his feet. And we went back up to the top, set up our bivy tent by then. And everything was soaking wet. But we crawled back in and said, we can't go down now. Then it cleared. Big windstorm came up, took care of a lot of the avalanche danger, believe it or not, and then we descended down. But I can remember when I knew we were finally out of danger, when, I, when we were, there was no more risk of avalanches, we knew we were going to be safe. It was the most emotional experience I think I've ever had in my life around climbing. I just threw my pack down and started weeping and sobbing, and I went, I, I just didn't have any words. All I could do was cry. And I can remember telling Keith sometime during that, I said, Keith, I'm crying because we're never going to go through this climb like this ever again together. Th this is what it is. All the years of training, all of what we committed to it, we may do other climbs. There'll never be another Iger. So it was really emotional. And then we made it back to Kleine Scheindegg. Some of the locals threw us a little party. Uh, you know, they were keeping track of us. There were helicopters during the day. The people down in Kleine Scheindegg, the helicopter operators, could make a lot of money when there was a wall, a team on the wall. So, you know, they could get whatever, two or three hundred dollars per passenger to fly by and watch the climbers go up. And uh, not real good for our nerves. Particularly, some of those pilots would come pretty close, and uh, we'd express to them the proper uh, hand signals to go away. Uh, but it added to the excitement, I think, a little bit for us. Yeah. What was to follow when you came back to the United States? And again, you two were the first yeah. American team to do this yeah. ascent. Well, Winter I called ascent. first person we called when we were off the wall and safe. I called Steve Camito. I said, "Boss, we pulled it off," and he was so happy. He goes, "I'm picking you up at the airport." And I said, "Well, that's going to be a couple weeks. We're going to Amsterdam. We're going to London. You know." He did pick us up, and uh, we, you know, the ride home from the airport. We told him all about it and everything, and. You know, that's really about it. I think there was a few news articles and that, and then Keith and I eventually went on a nationwide lecture tour, you know, and uh, that has stories. I, I, you know, we would charge whatever, $100 a talk, and some talks we'd make more, some barely any, and we literally had 16 or 17 of these talks lined up all over the United States. And almost every talk we made, uh, we had just enough money from that talk to buy gas and get food to get to the next talk. I mean, it was a break-even proposition, but it was fun. I feel it's important to mention that in this period of time, you're also getting into uh, triathlons and endurance races. Mm -hmm. How did you balance that with rock climbing? I think they both sort of the triathlon and running, biking balanced out the climbing. I think there's some good cross-training advantages from climbing and skiing and winter climbing and uh, biking. Um, I started running with one of my dear friends, Chris Reevely, and we still bike, climb, ski as hard as we can together to this day, of course. And um, we just mixed it up. You know, it all complemented each other. And uh, we dabble in triathlons and, you know, did the Ironman a couple times and some local things here. And they were just fun, you know. You also won some of these races. Some of the local ones. We had a local triathlon here that, uh, yeah, I was able to come in first a few times, I think. Was 
that called the Estes Alpine Classic? That was the Estes Alpine Classics. Um, and at that time, a very well-known um, climber named Chip Salon uh, was the race director and uh, a very good climber, very eccentric person and, uh, and, a, and a good athlete. And so he was the race director and uh, I climbed a little bit with Chip. In fact, did an expedition to the Arctic Circle with him in 1976, I believe. To the Arctic Circle. What did you do there? With Chip, we drove his car up the Alaska Highway and parked in a mining town called, in those days, Kentung. From Kentung, we filled up our backpacks and shuttled gear. We were attempting to climb the Lotus Flower Tower. Most normal climbers uh, and expeditions take a helicopter in and are deposited at the base of the climb. Chip wanted to do it without any outside support. That meant hiking in 100 miles each way. Well, we made it about 50 miles in and I burned out. It wasn't working out. We weren't getting along very well. Nothing major, but I went, eh, two people out here. And I was unsure if we were ever gonna actually get to the base of the climb. We had over 150 pounds between us. We were shuttling and and I, I, I thought we would just die of attrition before we'd get there. So I turned around, left Chip, and it was okay. I left him all whatever he needed, and he was gonna solo in there and do the climb. And so I went back out to the mining town and waited for, I think, three weeks to a month. Yeah. And um, I, I was taken care of, though, because I play piano, and uh, they needed a piano player to play at the the bar in this mining town and so I got food, I got drinks and I did some exploring around the, the village while I was waiting for Chip to come back and one day I'm walking down the road and I see this ghost of a figure kind of staggering with a light pack on and it was Chip and he was very uh, malnutritioned, uh, malnutritionist and uh, had really beat up his body being alone carrying that kind of weight for that long. And he ran into some trouble. He fell in a crevasse and it took him, I think a couple of days to get out, actually. I mean, it was a very serious thing. He came very close to dying. Three to four weeks sounds like a very long time to me. While you were waiting in town, were you worried about him? What kind of thoughts were going through your mind? <clears throat> At some point, I did start to wonder, hmm, he might not be coming back. And I was starting to come up with a plan. We, he, he said, he goes, look, give me a month. But, but I knew, I went, uh, you know, I was surprised that he hadn't called it off within three weeks. And um, I was trying to figure out, okay, I'm going to have to drive the car back because we had no radios or no phones to call anybody or anything. I thought about, well, I'll go in and start, you know, I'll mount a little expedition on my own. You know, there was no help around there. All, the, all these are, the locals are just miners, you know. And so um, I had started to entertain what might be coming up here. Never came true. Good. And the two of you returned to Estes Park? Uh, yeah, I think I went via California and he went via somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, following all of these incredible um, uh, ascents and trips, um, you came back to Estes Park and he started formulating a, a, a plan for a business called Kent Mountain Adventure Center. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, um, when I was working at Colorado Mountain School with Mike Donahue, um, I started a little youth climbing program. And Mike, we, we were really committed to the bigger picture of climbing. We, 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 both Mike and I really were like, yeah, climbing is, we both believed that climbing was really important for people, you know, anybody. And because we got a lot of benefit out of it. And I went, Mike, we got to start climbing with kids, you know, and he's like, let's do it. So I kind of dabbled in developing this youth program. 
And it started to grow and I started to become more passionate about it. You know, um, I was still climbing hard on my own and still guiding and stuff, but I went, this seems to be a good direction um, for me to go. So I talked to Mike, I said, I think I really need to go out on my own here. You know, I need to start my own business and, and really see what I can do with this. And he said, by all means, you know, he was disappointed, you know, because we were kind of partners and had this fantasy of doing this together for the rest of our lives. And it didn't go that way. That's OK. So um, I bought a checkbook uh, or, you know, took out a checking account at the First National Bank and um, started taking kids climbing, started taking kids on backpacking trips. Um, to Utah and other areas. And I did that with um, my wife at the time, um, Katie Bricker Kent. Yeah. So that was our program. We, we just started doing that and it grew and expanded and, and um, we started needing help. At first it was just her and I doing the trips, um, started taking on uh, help. And um, for a while, we were in the downstairs of Colorado Mountain School doing our program and then we moved out of there to a shack right below our home here and then we moved from there to another garage until its present day which is right here on our property we have the office and we have the garage where we store the gear so um, it's been a good journey so the the um the Mountaineering Adventure Center, or KMAC for short, um, opened officially in 1987. Right. From the get-go, what were some of your core values or philosophy behind introducing children to the sport of rock climbing? Good question. Like I said, I just was aware of the benefits that climbing gave me. Um, I was able, it just helped channel some energy uh, into positive things. Um, it requires concentration, it requires focus. And if you don't do those two things well, the results are very evident immediately. Like if you lose concentration and fall off a hold or whatever, there it is in front of you. Oh, I made a mistake. Let me go back up and try. And so I wanted to help kids, actually. I wanted them to have some of the tools that I thought climbing was giving me to be able to make other decisions in their lives. So we really focused, sure, on climbing, but the, we had this sort of thing that we were thinking in our heads that really this is about helping you in your life and helping you make decisions uh, that are going to be good ones for really other parts of your life. So we were committed in, into helping the kids more, really, than we were taking them climbing. You know, so that was the point. The KMAC has been in business now for about 26 right. years. Yeah. And I'm curious how you were able to offer this, this program to schools where rock climbing is still maybe a little bit on the fringe. Mm -hmm. How did you translate those uh, values that can be learned climbing to a school and, and offer this program to them? I've found over the years that having a business is about building relationships with the clients, the customers. Um, it goes further than that. It's about building relationships with teachers. Um, and I just really, I think, got very fortunate to have met some really uh, good teachers uh, early on in the business of Kent Mountain Adventure Center and I became friends with them. I mean, and we worked together, you know, we were like, hey, they'd say, hey, I've got 10 students that I think I'd like to take rock climbing. Can you help us? And I said, yeah, we'll do whatever it takes to, to take your group climbing. We'll do whatever it takes to take your group to Utah. So part of it was, I want the business. It was even more though, I just want to be part of what you're trying to give these kids. And so it's all about relationships, how you keep it going, how you keep the business going. And, um, you know, not being greedy and, ju and, and, and just realizing, you know, this is just what, what, what we do. And, and 
um, you got to have fun at it. You know, not only the clients, but I got to be able to have fun. And I got to be able to have free time. You know, we need to be able to, I want to be able to say, hey, I don't want to work now for a while. I want to go on an expedition. I want to go on a vacation. So relationships became very valuable and still to this day, long lasting friendships. Now that the business has grown, what is, what do you look for in guides for your own business? The first thing I look for in the guides or the question I ask myself is how will they, how well will they work with children? And when I say children, I mean from the ages of, you know, middle school, high school. Um, that's our niche. Uh, we work with college students. We work with adults. Some of the guides have their own climbing program that they do, and I help them out with that. <clears throat> but our niches are mostly teenagers. That's a difficult age, or can be. And so you could be the best climber in the world, but if you don't have the skills, uh, if you can't, Mike Donahue used to say, Mike Donahue used to say, you got to be able to come down to their level. And he's, he was right. Um, doesn't matter how hard you climb. It's about the relationship. And it's about being able to say, hey, that's okay if you don't make that climb. Or, hey, you know what? You're hiking slow. No problem. Let's take all day to get to here if we want. See, I think it's climbing. That's what we like. We think we're going to go climbing, but it really starts on the hike. That's really where the process starts. There have been times in my guiding career where I've gotten to the base of a climb and all we've done is sit and talk and then it's time to go home. We might get a rope out and make a knot or two. And that's what a good guide can give a client. Sure, there's clients that want, I want, to, want you to get me to the top of the diamond. No problem, we'll do that. Um, sometimes you gotta kinda throw them a curveball. They think they want that, but they might not. I'd like to move to a different topic for <coughs> a moment. Uh, you've done some root, root development in the area and um, I want to know if there are any um, memorable days out there, either with Scott Kimball in 1976 doing the crystal catch oh, yeah. on Lumpy Ridge. Uh -huh. Does that spark a memory? Um, nothing too major. The name, of course. And uh, I really don't remember that that was, I, I know I did that with Scott. But we were doing so many climbs back then, and some of them we would write up, and, and I guess we would submit it to whoever was the dean of the peaks at that point. I kind of forget now. Maybe it was Scott at some, at some point. He was the record keeper. Um, yeah, we did a lot of new climbs, and I was never one to really, okay, we did that climb, and I got to go back and record it and make sure that it's all there. Um, that never was really my thing. Um, I enjoyed the climbs and um, when, once they were done, I kind of let them go. You know, I've repeated a lot of them and, and if people ask questions, if I can remember them, I'll give them any beta I can. But um, it's sometimes funny because early on in there, sometimes somebody would say, hey, you know, we just did a new route and it goes up and then you traverse left and I'm going, I might have done that, but I don't know, you know, and that's fine. That's the way I actually would want it. Yeah. What is it like the second time around? You know how some climbers actually don't recall actual moves on a climb? I'm like that. In all my years of guiding, I could have a client climbing a crack below me and I'm pulling in the rope and they will say, Harry, what did you do here? And honestly, I'd have to say, you know, I don't quite remember. Maybe that's not a good guiding, good guiding. However, um, I, you know, maybe it's just so focused in that move that, and, and during that climb that, and then once it's complete, it's gone. 
a lot of the routes now, when I redo in some of the early first ascents that we've done, they seem new, they seem so fresh and they seem really nice. I can't remember any climbs that I have big sort of memories of, of events around the first ascents. Yeah. The Iger was obviously uh, uh, an emotional and a physical challenge um, given the, the conditions. Did you have any other close calls here in Estes Park and in Rocky Mountain National Park specifically? I've been real fortunate. Um, yeah, I have. Um, I remember one time early in my career, um, I took uh, my brother, Ray, um, up above Emerald Lake in winter. And we went halfway up the slope uh, beneath the dragon tail spires uh, and dug a snow cave um, halfway up. And then that night it snowed. And then the next day, we, we, all we were was doing was just bivouacking. That's what we wanted to do was go dig a cave and come down the next day. And it snowed. And the next morning we got up, put our skis on, and a huge avalanche we set off right below us. As I started to traverse on my skis, it was your classic slab release. And it was big, it was dangerous, and it went right below my skis. And I just can remember being there going, wow, this is scary. Didn't have a lot of knowledge back then. Didn't understand the dangers of new snow or avalanches. Not a good place to dig a snow cave in a storm, but we did. Um, no, I've had some experience in guiding um, where I've had, uh, I had to go help a couple clients, one client of mine who had a heart attack in winter. I wasn't with him, but he went up there on his own and um, he had a heart attack and somehow somebody found him and then we started a rescue and all that. But nothing real, I, the, the bivouacs I think, even though they're not necessarily life-threatening, those are the ones that are like, wow, this is going to be miserable. So. What brings you back? The passion. The, 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 the excitement and the discovery. Like, how am I going to do during this bivouac? Am I going to lose it emotionally? Am I going to freak out? I mean, I don't think I ever did, but, you know, I think climbing is a test. I mean, and, and, if, and you can actually dial in what questions you want it to ask you. If you want to take the big test, then go try to climb Everest, you know, solo, uh, you know, without much support. Um, so there's not, you know, I think I've gained knowledge of how I handle Harry Kent. You know, what, how do I handle stress? How do I handle um, difficulty? And, and, and also, ooh, here's a chance to really use my mind. You know, I can try to figure out how to get this traverse to go. I could try to figure out this anchor. I can try to figure out where to bivouac, what time to leave in the morning. So there's a challenge in trying to make it all happen. And that, that's exciting to me. You know, that brings me back. Okay, got a challenge. How are we going to pull it off? Well, thank you for sharing your, your motivation as, a, as an athlete and a, and a guide. I'm curious what observations you've made over the course of the last 30 years of the climbing community in Estes Park. How has it changed? I think the climbing community in Estes Park has changed a lot from when I was climbing actively every day or as much as we could back in the late 70s. Um, back then, for one, I don't think there weren't as many climbers. Um, I'm going to say there were a dozen of us living in Estes, maybe a few less, and we cl all climbed together. You know, we just kind of partnered up. But, you know, it was like this weekend I'd climb with Scott, next weekend it'd be Joe, this weekend it'd be you know, Keith or whoever, and everybody mixed it up and you didn't have a big pool to draw from. Nowadays, and, and also we didn't really, there wasn't a lot of money around then, you know, we, sure, some people, some of them had cars, um, but um, 
a trip to Boulder was a huge event. I mean, that was an expedition. Of course, I'd have to hitchhike down there, so we didn't go to Boulder all that much. And when we did, it was just, wow, we're in El Dorado. This is cool. And uh, very intimidating because it's very different than Lumpy Ridge. I can remember, you know, back then there was a restaurant called The Coffee Bar. And that's where we'd kind of group up and meet, or we'd meet at Comito's too. But we'd go there and drink coffee if the weather was bad, and we'd kind of fantasize and lie to each other about what we had done and stuff. But that's where you kind of began to get the plan going about what you're doing this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, the gear is so different now. The climbing gear has made and opened up such new challenging terrain for the climbers of nowadays. And that's just great to see the sport growing in those directions. I mean, they're climbing stuff now that I just can't fathom uh, myself. There was more of a community feeling to the climbing culture when I started here because it was smaller. We were really friends. And we weren't just climbing partners. You were also friends. And, you know, nowadays, sometimes it's like, hey, I just want to go climbing and just grab a partner, you know, like you might do at a climbing gym or something. So, again, the relationships were deeper. They, they were more satisfying, I think, to those people that were interested in going deeper with the relationships. Um, it, there was more adventure, I think, back then. There was, obviously, there was new routes to be done. So every climb was an adventure. Nobody had been, if you were doing a new route, even if you were doing a route that had been done before, it hadn't been done many years before. And uh, so there was sort of always adventure, you know? It was always like, wow, how are we gonna use this gear? And it, 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 it just required a lot more gear and it required more tinkering around and the climbs took forever back then. You know, nowadays you're like, well, let's go to Lumpy and I think we can do three climbs if we go out to Sundance or the book. Back then, we do one climb and it took all day. And it was slow and, you know, we didn't hang a lot back then either. And that was, I guess, maybe the standard that this local climbing community developed in Estes. We weren't hang dogs. You, if you couldn't do a climb, you'd down climb and then rappel off, come back the next day. Um, a lot of that too is because the climbs nowadays is just easy to hang, easy to plug in gear and hang. Back then, it was just more traditional. You know, if you couldn't get up it, you probably wouldn't get up it. You might aid up it, but you wouldn't try to free climb it and then hang and shake out and rest and then go back up. Why was it so taboo to hang on gear? It's the game that you can make it. And some, for some reason, I think this, in Estes, we, we kind of felt like, you know what, if you got to hang, you're not a very good climber. I think that's a way to become even a better climber. I think once you hang, there's a mental part of the process that's short-circuited. It is for me. If I can always never, if I can do a climb and then down climb and rest, go back up, down climb and rest, and if I can't do it, I'm going down, somehow that keeps the continuum of the mental process intact. Once you hang, you've broken something. Are there any last stories or yeah. thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, you know, I, um, you asked, I think, Steve, you know, what, uh, what would you say to somebody who was going to start climbing or, or what, I forget exactly the question you asked him, but my answer to, to climbing and life in general is don't hold back. If there's something you want to do, do what it takes to make that dream happen for yourself. If there's an avenue you want to go down, Make it happen. If there's a climb that you think, I don't know, I think I want to, but I don't know, try. Yeah. Thank you for your time, Harry. Sure. Yeah.